The season hasn't even started, and we're already seeing ESPN throw some shade towards the Kentucky Wildcats. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Daw, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be discussing ESPN disrespecting our boy Trey Mitchell It needs to stop, and we're going to explain why. Also, we have an update to Kentucky's non-conference slate. I want to talk about that individual team that the Wildcats will now be playing, and I also kind of want to just overall look at some of the really difficult games that the Wildcats have to begin the season. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. want to remind everybody out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. It would mean a ton to us here at Locked On Kentucky. And also, if you're listening on podcasts, follow along there wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, follow, whatever the button says. Appreciate it if you tapped it. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. ESPN has released their transfer portal rankings uh, for uh, all all of college basketball. And I believe it was 100 players uh, that they had in this ranking. It might have been more. But according to Tristan Ferris, who did a little digging on Trey Mitchell, he is this season, apparently, according to ESPN, the 64th best college basketball transfer. He's ranked behind several players who have yet to start a college basketball game. And I'm going to be straightforward with you. I'm perplexed. So diving into it a little bit more with Ferris, I, I think, makes it a little bit more interesting Because in Ferris's tweet that he had about this list, you also see a couple of seasons ago, whenever he transferred from UMass to Texas, that in 2021, Trey Mitchell was ranked fifth overall by the same writer at ESPN who did the college basketball transfer portal rankings in the summer. So Trey Mitchell, within two seasons has gone from transferring from UMass, by the way, UMass, and being described as a dominant big man for the Minutemen this past season, earning first-team All-Atlantic, or All-A-10 honors, dominant big man. He goes from being the fifth-best player to transferring to Texas to then transferring to West Virginia, and now he's at Kentucky, and apparently he's no longer a dominant big man. He's just kind of there, according to this writer from ESPN. So much so there that he has dropped 60 spots, essentially, 59 spots in his rankings. And this is what the writer has to say about Trey Mitchell. Kentucky will be Mitchell's fourth school in five seasons after starting starring at UMass and making a one season or one season stops at Texas and West Virginia. Talented big man who offers a perimeter threat. Career career averages of 13.7 points and 5.9 rebounds. So all of the sudden, we have gone from dominant big man to just eh, talented big man. You know, he's he's just kind of there. It's whatever. And we've dropped him 60 spots. One more thing to note here in Tristan Ferris's tweet is the fact that Antonio Reeves last season was ranked, what was it, 30? He was ranked 36th. Among all players, the dude that was averaging 20 points and shooting almost 40% from three was 36th. In case you're wondering, Hunter Dickinson is the number one overall player. Ryan Nimhart is the second. Jesse Edwards is the third. And then Max uh, Amos is the fourth. Caleb Love to Arizona is the fifth here on this ESPN list. I'm not going to sit here and dog uh, ESPN or Jeff Borzello, who, is, who was the author of this, of this article. But I want, to, I want to say a couple of different things here. There is no way that Trey Mitchell is the 64th best transfer portal edition. He's just not. He, he, he's just not. There are, there are several other players here that I think are significantly better. Let's just, ta- let's just take one random one here. I'm just going to scroll into the list 
And let's see, Johan Treor at, at number 41, transferred from Ar- Auburn to UC Santa Barbara. He was a former five-star prospect that decommitted from LSU, barely played down the stretch of 2022, doesn't even have his statistics on there. And I can tell you as somebody that, uh, that has followed uh, the Auburn Tigers uh, for a good amount of time, uh, the man did not play, and whenever he played, he played terribly. Let's let's keep it let's keep it pushing. Let's let's look. Let's see. Keon Min, uh, Minifield committed to Arkansas from Washington. Averaged ten points and three point one assists in the Pac twelve, which is currently a dying conference, as opposed to Trey Mitchell, who is a versatile big man. <laughs> Why is Trey Mitchell underneath him? Let's keep going here. Number fifty or number fifty one. Jameer Nelson Jr. This is one I don't understand. Averaged 20.6 points and 3.6 assists at his former at his former college, Delaware. Go Blue Hens. I've got a, got a couple of friends that go to Delaware. But he's 51st. 20.1 points going to TCU, a power six school. That's not a good addition. I don't know. How about this? Daniel Bacto, 6'11 sophomore from uh, that is now at Texas uh, Tech, committed to, uh, to or from Texas Tech. He committed to Louisiana Tech. Had 21 points and six uh, boards against Ohio State, 17 against Creighton, and a double double against Georgetown. Battled injuries over the second half of the season. The dude didn't play. When he played, he had a couple of great games. Cool. Is that worth uh, putting him 46th? Uh, of like almost 20 spots, 18 spots above uh, above our, our boy here, Trey Mitchell. And then let's let's go down right above Trey Mitchell, Cormac Ryan and Javon Quinterly. Javon Quinterly has been at Al- has been in college basketball for what feels like a decade now. Formerly of Alabama, former five star prospect, did did nothing for the Crimson Tide for a couple of seasons. And then they had to start him because of rotations and, and issues there. And he ended up playing decent, but he's not a great three-point shooter. He's averaged 11 and a half points per game. Cool. What about the dude from Nor- Notre Dame, Cormac Ryan, committed to North Carolina? 12.3 points in 2022. How is, that, how is that objectively better than what Trey Mitchell's brought to the table? I don't know. I don't know, especially considering Trey Mitchell has shown uh, across the board that he can fill it up wherever he goes, immunity. He can he can score wherever he goes. He can distribute wherever he goes. He can shoot. Now, it's very evident. He's a good spot-up three-point sh- shooter, catch-and-shoot three-point shooter off the pick-and-pop. He's a valuable addition to any school out there. I am very curious to see if he had ended up somewhere else where he would have fallen on this list. And I'm not claiming ESPN has Kentucky bias, far from that. But what I'm going to sit here and tell you that the disrespect for one of the most versatile pieces in the transfer portal, quite frankly, I think is ridiculous. We talked yesterday about the distributors on this team. We talked about how great Rob Dillingham is going to end up being distributing the basketball for Kentucky. And we talked about how good DJ Wagner's gotten at it. And we talked about how Reed Shepard, I think, is good enough at it. Um, But but you've got several players on this roster who, if given the opportunity, can really spread the ball around and rack up the assist. Again, most notably notably Dillingham. But I'm looking at this Trey Mitchell edition, and we saw this in the Global Jam. And I'm sitting there going, man, this guy can, can really be a valuable source of offense for Kentucky not just scoring, but also just being that threat and getting other guys open looks. Kentucky's got a lot of really good catch and shoot three point or three point guys on this team. Antonio Rees, I think DJ, DJ Wagner in his uh, in his limited time with the Global Jam, I thought he showed that he's able to do that. Shepard, Rob Dillingham, actually, if I'm not mistaken, knocked down his one catch and shoot three, and he it was he got fouled on it too. Again, just a tough shot maker. Um, we talked about that yesterday. Um, among other things. Uh, but Trey Mitchell, the disrespect here, I think is ridiculous and it needs to stop. If you've got any thoughts on Trey Mitchell, if you've got any thoughts on Kentucky's big men, if you've got any thoughts on the transfer portal and ESPN ranking him 64th, which just doesn't seem right, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below or hit me on the socials at Locked on UK. Before I get to the non-conference slate, I want to say a couple of different things here about yesterday's episode because some of you you were very upset about it. 
my goal here on the sh- on the show is not to divide players. At the same time, though, I think we need to understand the reality of our situation. This is a podcast. This is a YouTube. This is a video podcast um, that, quite frankly, I don't think has the traction to make anyone uh, in that program, the Kentucky basketball program, upset. I don't think we have the power to do so. I don't think any anything that I say behind this microphone is going to truly offend anybody in that locker room or on that coaching staff to the point of saying something or I'm having an emotional reaction to it. Nothing that I say matters to them. And I, I also want to emphasize something else to you guys. And I'm not trying I'm not trying to be rude here. Some of you in the in the comments for months now claim that I am a part of the Kentucky media or that I'm a beat writer. I want to I want to be very clear here. In no way, shape, or form am I in a, am I a beat writer for the Kentucky Wildcats. No way. No way, shape, or form. This is a video podcast. I am coming at you as a fan who has been employed to discuss the Kentucky basketball program, among other sports when they're extre- whenever they're exciting and relevant to, to the fans. So I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to give you my takes. I'm going to give you my opinions. I'm going to give you my thoughts. It does not mean that I'm a beat writer, that I'm a journalist who is going to walk out here and try and give you the most objective opinion possible because that's the integrity of journalism. Blah, 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 blah. That, that's, that's not what I am. Now, there will be moments, a lot of them, throughout this season where I just, I'm straightforward with you, where it's just like, this is not being done well. Statistically, Kentucky's not performing well in this category. The Wildcats are failing here. The Wildcats are doing really, really well here. There will be moments where, where I just call it like it is. But for the most part here, it's me giving you my thoughts, my opinions. And I can appreciate everybody out there saying, oh, don't rile feathers up. Don't pe- get people upset. This is going to divide the locker room with you saying stuff like this. I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the power to do that. And if I did, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. I'd be in the locker room. So I appreciate everybody in, in their opinion and their thoughts on how I approach the, the, my stance on the guard rotation this upcoming season. And I agree, it's harsh. Should I, should I phrase it differently? Probably. But at the same time, I'm excited about all of these guys and their different abilities. And so I'm calling it with my take. I'm, I'm just looking at it and saying... I think that DJ Wagner's your starting point guard. Reed Shepard's going to play more than Dillingham. I think overall he's a more versatile guard. Rob Dillingham may be the best distributor in, on this team. He may be one of the best ball handlers in the SEC by the time it's all said and done. We all agree on that. But I think Reed Shepard's probably going to play more than than Rob Dillingham. I mean that, that's that's not that that's not an extremely insane take. After seeing the Global Jam, and I understand some of you were in the comments were just like, well, you're basing this off of a few practices in, in the Global Jam. Yes, I am. I'm, I've watched them play, and that is my opinion. And I appreciate all of you guys sharing your opinions in the YouTube comments. And I'm not telling you not to. I'm just telling you, I'm not a beat writer. I'm not a journalist. I'm not somebody that's going to go out here and report anything to you directly without citing somebody else. I have people... I have friends that do that. And if you want to go consume that media, you can do that. Absolutely. But if you're going to talk on this show with me, you're going to get a little bit of a different product. So anybody out there that has an issue with that, I apologize. But that's just the way that we're, that I'm going to do things. It's the way that I like to do things. Just giving my opinion and then calling it like it is whenever we have to call it like it is. So if you've got any thoughts on Trey Mitchell on the program, anything, again, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. All right, I want to get to this non-conference slate. Talking about something positive here. Because I think Kentucky, despite all of the difficulties of this non-con slate, I have a feeling they're going to handle it a little bit differently than they did last season. I want to get to that in just a second. Before we do that, though, guys, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. It's very difficult to pinpoint the right people 
at the right time and get them to actually perform the way you want to because it's kind of difficult to scout some people out with the initial process that you go through. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team for fast, or that's faster and for free. All you have to do is go over to linkedin.com slash locked on college and just put it out there that you're hiring. Add your job to the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are indeed looking to make a hire. They have really simple tools like screening questions to make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you would like to interview and higher. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs the number one source in delivering quality hires versus leading to competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Again, you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, continuing along here on the Thursday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. Really appreciate everybody hanging out with me here. Um, if we've ruffled some feathers over the past couple of days, I apologize. We're going to keep it pushing. Um, I, I don't think that that's it, it's nearly as important as some people may think it is. So I appreciate everybody out there that's watching or listening. If you're listening on podcast and, if you, and you didn't listen to yesterday's show and you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, you can go listen to it to add some context. Maybe you'll get offended too. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate everybody that has stuck around. If this is your first show, if this is somehow your first episode of Locked On Kentucky, appreciate it if you sub to the channel or you sub to the podcast feed wherever you're watching. And after you're done listening to this podcast, I would appreciate it if you went and listened to the college Locked On College Basketball Podcast with Andy Patton and Isaac Shade. They do a great, great, great job over there covering all things college basketball. I hop on there quite a bit. It's a great time. Andy Patton, Isaac Shade, Locked On College Basketball, wherever you get your podcast, also on YouTube. So, Kentucky basketball's non-conference slate this upcoming season is tough. We've got some fun games, some winnable games, with an overall what I think is a better team. And now they've added another really, I think, interesting opponent to the slate, UNC Wilmington has been added to the non-conference slate, according to Rocco Miller, who is a college basketball analyst. The Wildcats will host the Seahawks for the first ever meeting between the two, two schools on Saturday, December 2nd. Kentucky has not announced their actual non-conference slate. They have not announced how they're going to schedule everything out, and, and they've not fleshed it out, I think, to the fullest extent and we understand that it's July, you know, you know, people are still trying to find different games to, to play and such. And a couple of years ago, we really got to see that with the Wildcats where a couple different issues with COVID caused uh, some chaos with, uh, with the slate. But I am excited to see Kentucky play this UNCW squad on top of all of their other non-conference opponents. Because you may say, UNC Wilmington... Who are they? What, what are, are, are they even? It sounds like a no name, you know, group of, uh, or, uh, what is it? Mid major school, I should say. I keep, I keep thinking about football in my mind. I keep going to group of five. Well, according to Ken Palm, and you know how much I love Ken Palm. If you've been around on this show for a while, uh, you, you will know how much I, I love talking about Ken Palm and their analytics. Last year, UNC Wilmington went 24 in 10, actually. They were one of the better teams. In their conference, the Colonial Athletic Association, the CAA, started off the season really hot, had a little bit of a, a rough patch there towards the end, won two games in the CAA tournament before they get, getting bounced by Charleston. They were a decent team on defense, and they were a poor team on offense. That's not necessarily surprising, considering they had a first-year head coach in Takayo Siddle, or not a first-year head coach, uh, just a, a very new young head coach in Takayo Siddle, uh, who has been there now for two full seasons. He was named the interim, I think, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, named the interim just a couple of seasons ago. And, he, and he's been really solid since. So it's a very young team um, for them last season. They were 236th in the Division One experience. So they, they, they did not have a lot going for them uh, in the experience department. And I think that led to some inconsistencies 
scoring the basketball. They got to the foul line, though. They did get to the foul line uh, a decent amount. uh, Trezarian White is their best player. He is back for this team. Uh, He's going to be a solid wing for them. That'll be an interesting matchup against Antonio Reeves this upcoming season. But the thing about UNCW that I like is, on top of the fact that it's a first-time opponent, is that I think it's genuinely going to be one of those games where it's like, it's not just like, oh, well, you know, they'll roll over and and, and really Kentucky's just going to take it to them a month into or three weeks into the season. I think that this will end up being an opponent that gives Kentucky a run for their money because of the coach that I'm very impressed with so far during his tenure. He went 27-9 and nine, uh, just two seasons ago, 24-10 and 10, again this past year. They've got a roster that's building experience. They've got a defense that's actually pretty sound. Um, I, I like the numbers that I see from them. I see the potential here. And Kentucky's got a young team, too. And I understand in most situations here in the non-con slate, my analysis has been, eh, talent wins out. It's whatever. Um, but I truly do think that this will be a game where Kentucky's talent will have to win out because I think that the coaching on the other side of the ball or other side of the court is going to end up being pretty solid. So, UNC Wilmington, again, Saturday, December 2nd, is the addition here. The non-conference slate as a whole, let's talk about some of these games. And I, I want to do a whole show on this at, at some point here in the near future. Although Kentucky is yet to announce their 2023-2024 non-conference schedule, look at some of these games here. Okay, Kansas in the United Center in Chicago for the Champions Classic on November 14th. That was at the Champions Classic last year. I'd like to go again this year, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Miami during the ACC-SEC Challenge on November 28th. That's going to be at home. So you have Kansas, Miami, the CBS Sports Classic against North Carolina, Ohio State, or UCLA. So that will be a fun game there in the CBS Sports Classic per usual. You're going to play at Louisville, and then you're going to get Gonzaga at home. I want to reiterate these games. Kansas, Miami, North Carolina, Ohio State, UCLA, Louisville, Gonzaga. Again, UNC, OSU, UCLA, those are three games. One of those games is going to happen. Let's just say let's just say it's North Carolina for the fun of it. You've got two ACC schools on your non-con slate. You've got three ACC schools on your non-con slate, excuse me, including um including Louisville. You've got Gonzaga, who will be once again very strong. You get the you get those uh, Bulldogs at home. You get the Jayhawks and the Champions Class. I mean, there are some really fun games here. There are some difficult games. Miami was a Final Four team last year. Gonzaga knows how to score. North Carolina is looking not elite, but solid under Hubert Davis, and I'm intrigued to see what they look like this year. I believe R.J. Davis is back for them. Uh, UCLA would be just a really difficult matchup. I know UCLA is losing a lot, but Mick Cronin and that defense is going to be tough to get past. Ohio State, I know absolutely nothing about. (laughs) Um, And then Kansas, obviously. That game, I think, will be heated for a variety of reasons. After losing to the Jayhawks last season at home in Rupp, and then also because of the fact that Hunter Dickinson ended up choosing the Jayhawks over UK. I think that there will be a lot of juicy storylines heading into November 14th for Kentucky. And that will be a game that I'm really looking forward to, to covering. So... This non-con slate, I am thrilled with. And I think that there are some games here that Kentucky can win. I, I think that they can truly, you know, make their mark here to start the season. It's just a question of whether or not they're going to actually be able to execute, unlike last season, in high-pressure pressure situations. So, if you've got any thoughts on the non-con slate, if you've got any thoughts on Kentucky's upcoming season that I'm thrilled about, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. And I think that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter, at LockedOnUK. You can follow me on Twitter, at LanceDahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave them in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.